Good morning, Jags. Uh, this is Fahad. Today is uh, Tuesday, July 7th. Uh, I have Chronicle with me. Hi, Chronicle. How are you? Fahad, I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. So Chronicle would like to present a peer trade in today's Jaguar media presentation. And the peer trade is the long idea um, in apartment treat called Mid-America Apartments, symbol MAA. And on the short side, we would like to short Boston property, symbol BXP, which is a commercial REIT uh, with high uh, concentration in New York City and San Francisco. So uh, with that said, let's get started. Chronicle, tell me about it. Sure. Uh, this is a REIT sector pair trade that encapsulates how COVID-19 and work from home serves to accelerate migration to non-gateway cities as these places offer a lower cost of living, less population density and congestion, and perhaps a better quality of life. So um, the reason we're doing this as a pair trade is because we have no edge in forecasting whether the REIT sector as a group will trade higher or lower going forward. Where we do have an edge is in knowing Mid-America Apartments has better growth prospects than Boston Properties going forward. So uh, let's get started with the short leg, um, right. which is Boston Properties. Uh, this is a well-known commercial REIT that everybody's probably heard of. Uh, in short, this company deals in large-scale Class A office properties, about 200 in total. And uh, they mainly focus on the central business districts of five major gateway cities, namely Boston, uh, New York City, DC, LA, and San Francisco. And this diagram here shows the breakdown of the company's net income portfolio in terms of geography. Uh, so brief background, heading into this COVID-19 crisis, the company had already been struggling with slow growth for several years now. And if we look at the historical stock price, the stock has really gone nowhere since 2015. It's mostly due to um, continued oversaturation in city centers as well as management's high level of conservatism. They only acquire low risk assets with lease duration of at least 96 months, very conservative. And lastly, just by virtue of already being the largest publicly traded REIT office REIT in the country, um, achieving additional growth relative to peers becomes that much harder. And going forward over the next 12 months, I have here three major reasons why I think the company is going to underperform the REIT sector. Uh, first off, uh, about 30% of the company's tenants are in the financial industry. And one observation that has gone a bit under the, under the radar is how quickly the employees of major banks and financial services firms have adapted to remote work, despite all of the complications and data security risks involved. This leads us to the theme of permanently shifting uh, finance jobs away from the office. As we previously covered, uh, we've seen the leaders at Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, MasterCard, Visa, and so on, uh, and many more, are now questioning the need for as much office floor space. All, this company, all these companies currently have between 80 to 90% of their employees working remotely, and looking at the overall picture, according to a partnership for New York City poll recently in June, more than a third of respondents in the financial sector predicted that just 10% of their employees would return to um, offices by August 15th and only 29% by December 31st. So our thinking here is if all these firms are expecting less than a third of their workers returning by the end of the year, it implies they already have the infrastructure in place to work from home and to continue doing so indefinitely. And it also begs the question of whether these companies can start sourcing talent across the nation rather than just locally. So I think all of this is going to result in a weakening of Boston Properties negotiating power in terms of rent retention and prices. You know, staying on the New York side, I do have a picture here I'd like to share real quick. And this, uh, you know, we're talking Boston properties in terms of its commercial exposure, but we're seeing the same kind of trend emerge even on the urban residential side, particularly in Manhattan, where we're seeing record amount of losses in the last couple of months. The, the second quarter sales down 54% year over year. 
the total sales hit their lowest number on record in the second quarter and median prices in Manhattan apartments are down 18 percent so this is a trend that is also speaking for the same large picture that you're painting over here where it's not just commercial but also residential being affected as more people move out or work from home crowd continues to basically you know categorically shift people out of the city into spots in the suburbs and such um according to some of the most recent data that we were looking at just as i was sharing with some some clients as well um the median apartment price by 18 fell by 18 percent to one million dollars on average now if you've ever lived in new york city you would know that buying a million dollar apartment is actually really nothing um in new york but so it'd be interesting how far down it can actually go so interesting just to go along with your same thoughts on the second um, headwind that you have here on Boston properties, uh, this also speaks to the same uh, deteriorating trend in New York City, but we also had a similar play on OZK not too long ago that was a speaking around the same uh, idea of vacancies rising. Tell me about it. Yeah, so the key things to note here are that population growth in New York City has been negative since 2017 and office demand was already declining with vacancies up 260 basis points to 11.3% uh, in two years. And this was all during what was supposed to be a strong period economically. This is important because New York City is 35% of Boston properties rental revenue, which is the highest exposure out of all the cities where it operates. Uh, and to add to what's already been discussed discussed with Bank OZK, Savills was out with a report in late June forecasting Manhattan asking rents to decline 26% to a nine-year low of $62 per square foot in a prolonged recession. This, could be, this would be bad because Manhattan office rents had already been flat uh, since 2015. And separately, uh, Moody's is forecasting office vacancy rates to rise to 20% uh, by next year with New York City uh, rents down 25%. And um, in the write-up that's attached to this video, um, you can see the calculations that uh, of why this makes sense. Uh, lastly, this has kind of been forgotten, but the $10,000 SALT cap on deductions for state and local taxes has resulted in making New York an increasingly unattractive place to live in. It's easy to forget that this was the major contributor to um, negative population growth in the city since 2017. And it'll probably be exacerbated if uh, remote work for some employees become permanent. That's a great point about SALT deduction. That was indeed a major blow to major cities when the tax cuts were passed in 2017. I know that firsthand that um, many real estate investors that I know actually suffered from that. Um, you know, the key point on the slide is when you mentioned that uh, Moody's is forecasting office vacancy rates to rise to 20% by 2021, while the rental income will drop by 25% in New York City. When I see deterioration in the operational side of the business of this magnitude, the very first question that comes to my mind is what kind of balance sheet do they have? Do they have enough buffer on the balance sheet to basically sustain through a what could be a very, very difficult period going forward from here? What's the leverage on BXP balance sheet? So um, leverage has been going up and it currently stands at 7.2% up from uh, 5% uh, back in 2015. Uh, the rise has been gradual and um, you know, the, the, at, to be clear, point, that's the that's the that's the, the um, that's a debt over EBITDA ratio, right? So 7.2x. Right. Okay. And what was it three years ago? Let, let's say. Um, it was at 5.1, and that, which is around uh, industry average right now. Yeah, and that takes us. So it has been rising above seven. Is already a little bit of a red flag. 
that takes us uh, to your third headwind over here, which has to do with the Silicon Valley, which you think is not baked into consensus view. Now, keep this point in mind to all the audience that when you hear about this third headwind, we just discussed leverage in the balance sheet already above 7x. And so if this is not baked into consensus view, when it is baked in, you're going to see the EBITDA line, which is a denominator, falls off even more, which makes the debt to EBITDA ratio go up even more. And at some point, this, this basically turns from an operational problem for the company into a balance sheet problem and raising capital becomes even more, uh, even harder and harder, at least at the attractive prices. So tell me about the number three headwind. Yeah, so uh, this is important because Boston Properties has 26% exposure to tech uh, with the majority in the Bay Area. Similar to professionals in the financial industry, the average tech worker is highly paid and will not face a lot of difficulties in transitioning to remote work. So I think the risk of tech companies and startups eventually moving away from Silicon Valley to a higher from anywhere model is being understated right now. Uh, you know, we've already seen Twitter and Square announce employees will have the option to work from home forever. Meanwhile, Google and Facebook are allowing employees to work from home through the end of the year. And according to a Q2 CNBC workforce survey, 83% of respondents from the tech industry reported they've been able to work from home with more than a quarter saying they want to work from home all the time from now on, while another 36% declared they want to work from home uh, more often than they used to. From, and meanwhile, from the employer's perspective, a similar trend is emerging among the smaller firms, with a recent Forbes survey, survey uh, showing three quarters of 165 respondents saying they believe the transition to work from home will be uh, beneficial to productivity. And separately, Redfin carried out a polling last month, and they found out that more than 50% of respondents would move out of San Francisco if they were given the green light to work remotely. Uh, if you look at the attached research note, um, you'll, see the, you'll see a table from Redfin that shows San Francisco coming in second only to New York City in terms of net uh, outflows in population. And worryingly, Refin says that um, Bay Area residents are making up the largest portion of migrants looking to uh, move to non-gateway and suburban markets, with nearly 75% uh, of uh, out-of-town searches originating from uh, San Francisco. So this is another headwind. Actually, and staying on that topic, I do have another chart, which is similar to New York City as well. This one is related to San Francisco. And this has to do with the inventory homes, inventory of homes that are listed for sale in, in San Francisco. We have, we have seen a dramatic increase in the last two months of so many homes that are now in the market, all trying to sell all at the same time. That the last time when we saw this number reach act, you know, more than a thousand homes, um, and you have to go back to what happened in 2008, 2009, 2010. So this trend will probably continue. And, you know, I was just reading another news that Twitter, uh, Facebook and Google, those three tech companies have actually already told, I think Twitter, in, 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 in case of Twitter, it's 100 percent that any everybody can go back and just work from home. So some of these companies will make it permanent to just work from home offsite, while others will allow a fairly large percentage of their employee base to work from home. So it, it speaks for both residential and the commercial problems that we're seeing in the inner cities. Um, Great stuff on BXP. Now, moving on to the long idea, Mid-America Apartment. Uh, you want to pair this long idea with the short in BXP. Now, tell me high-level view and what is uh, what about Mid-America? Sure. Uh, Mid-America is a residential REIT that operates about 100,000 apartment homes across the southern Sunbelt states, uh, specializing in the very non-gateway markets where most of these people from the cities are moving to. In fact, uh, just under 60% of all U.S. domestic moves in the last decade were to markets where this company operates, which has been uh, the main driver for growth. Because, well, when, when you're a young single professional that's migrating, uh, you, you're going to want to initially rent a place for, say, 12 months to get a feel for your new surroundings rather than 
buying a new house immediately. So moving on to the next slide, one thing that separates uh, Mid-America from its peers is that their operating expenses per property is well below average due to three things. Uh, these things being their local expertise, their heavy investment in technology, as well as aggressive cost control with their unique uh, web-based property management system. Basically, it's an AI-driven solution, which includes automated inspection and maintenance, as well as management of apartment unit data, monitoring uh, utility usage, uh, digital marketing, as well as automated leasing. Uh, according to management, this has all resulted in average annual um, same property expense growth of just 2.5% versus sector average of 3, 3%. In dollar terms, uh, the company says its total annual value creation from this uh, expense control has nearly tripled from 55 million in 2015 to uh, 140 million in 2019. So this has been a key contributor to uh, earnings. That's really uh, impressive. I don't know if I have come across many reefs that deploy the 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 technological edge to the level where that that we're seeing right here in Mid America. The AI screening that's very impressive to keep the annual expense control growth at only two point five percent, given the type of uh, housing inflationary trends that we usually see around us. Next one, um, two large projects. Yeah, so uh, they're currently in the middle of a large-scale two-year project to upgrade its apartments and install smart home technology into a quarter of its properties. And this is going to see revenue benefit in 2021. So the trials at 15 properties last year were well-received. And although the program was temporarily halted in March, uh, these installations are set to resume in July. All in, the company is forecasting 240 million in uh, net value creation from this project alone by 2021, which would imply at least 70% growth in value creation versus 2019. On top of that, the company's high-speed internet access initiative is also being deployed, and management expects this program to have a further 50 basis point contribution to uh, uh, this year's net income growth. That's really good. Um, let me play real quick uh, a devil's advocate over here. In one of the slides, um, right, this one as well, you pointed out the company has the highest exposure to Dallas-Fort Worth market, which is about 13% of the total rental income coming from that area alone. Um, I wouldn't expect this, but would you think that the um, the the the, 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 the oil industry mess that is affecting the Texas as a state overall would have any impact on their rental income or or maybe an argument to be made that, that they may actually be beneficiary of that trend because if people start to trade down that you may actually also sh see a shift from residences to actual apartments. Uh, just a quick thought on this one or no thoughts at all? So uh, management did touch on a bit of um energy sector worries in their uh, latest transcript from the conference call. And um, while that is a worry, they say that um, they don't have as much exposure to that as they do to, um, to residents who are employed in other white collar industries. Got it. Okay. So uh, there, there's little to worry about here with regards to rent collection. The company recently provided an update in early June, uh, they've collected 99% of April rent and 96% of May rent in cash. And to provide some perspective, the industry average is 90% for April and low 90s for May. Uh, meanwhile, the occupancy rate of the company has remained steady at 95% with about 8,700 new leases in May and year versus year ago, uh, 8,400. And the reasons behind this resilience, um, I think it's mainly to do with the high quality resident profile as well as regional affordability. Like as we can see in this diagram, over 60% of all current residents are in industries that have remained intact uh, with work from home policies in place. And secondly, these residents are mostly single professionals in uh, well-paying jobs. So 
they're not exactly living from paycheck to paycheck. And lastly, the living costs uh, in these regions tend to be lower than that of, say, coastal cities and other large metros that these people are migrating from. Yeah, I agree with that. A very well diversified portfolio when you think about uh, the the uh, the dispersion of the customer base that they have here on this slide. Great stuff. Um, so you expect uh, Mid America MAA to outperform BXP over the next 12 to 18 months, and here's a ratio chart that illustrates that. So naturally, in this case, we would expect this ratio chart to go up even more whether the market is going up. That's the beautiful thing about doing pair trades all the time, where you don't care exactly how the sector performs or how the overall market performs. You just expect one to outperform the other, so you could be comfortably positioned into this one. Good stuff. Um, any last word on this slide? Um, nope, I, I expect a revisit uh, of 1.5 to be uh, the initial target here. On the ratio, which would actually make this about 20% gain if it goes from current levels to about the 1.5 uh, right. where, where they were until two months ago. Excellent stuff. Thank you, Chronicle. This was a great presentation. Hope everybody enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time.